Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast. This is Bruce Hutchin, host and executive producer. Each week, you will hear tips, techniques, strategies, and personal stories from some of the best and funniest whitetail hunters in North America. Hope you enjoy today's episode. If you do, tell a friend on social media. If not, tell me and I'll make it better. Thanks for listening, folks. This is Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast, episode number 422. On the next episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, we're going to travel to uh, Dodgeville, Wisconsin, and catch up with Art Highland. Now, Art Highland has Art Highland Outdoors, and Art travels all over the Midwest doing seminars uh, all winter long because he represents some great companies like Vortex, Night and Hail, uh, Realtree. But more than that, Art spins a good story, and he gets people laughing. And he sure does know his stuff. And on this show, you're going to hear about deer vocalization. And with the season coming up, pay attention because Art knows how to sound like a buck. Welcome to a special episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, and I have my partner with me today, Bob Rourke. And this is episode three of our current Whitetail webinar, webinar series. And today's guest is Art Helen. Timing of deer, vocalization, and rattling. Art, what do you think about all this deer talk? Um, you know, there's a lot of different variations of it, and there's a lot of different uh, opinions on it. And, uh, you know, there's no better person or no better um, vocalization itself than the deer itself. And uh, I've been fortunate to be able to hunt a lot during all the phases of the season. And uh, so I get to hear how these deer you know, communicating what they do and, uh, which really helps, I think, instead of just reading a book or looking at something. And, uh, so that knowledge that I get firsthand, you know, I, I get to bring it to people through seminars and, and through webisodes like this. That's great. And Hey, why don't you just take a couple minutes and introduce yourself? I know you're known throughout the Midwest, but we're pretty much across North America. So why don't you give us a little bio, just a couple minutes telling everybody what art does. So I'm Art Helen. Um, I've been in the outdoor industry for 23 years now, and uh, I've been fortunate. As I said, I've I've filmed with uh, Archer's Choice TV show for almost 10 years. I've been able to film with some other TV shows uh, and hunt across the country. I uh, also, um, my wife and I, Michelle, we do a lot of different things with special needs and youth to get things uh, get young adults, uh, young children involved in the outdoors. That's what we basically focus on now. I don't do a lot of the filming and stuff anymore because I, I concentrate so much on my seminars and trying to get the youth and uh, special needs and other people just involved in the outdoors. So traveling around the country, uh, doing seminars, doing some outdoor writing, uh, working with a couple people on some different things with some books. I have a wildlife uh Manage habitat management company, so I go out and help set up properties uh, strictly for deer and turkeys and, and wildlife. So uh, that kind of keeps me busy throughout. And I also have a uh, photography business where I do a lot of wildlife photography work uh, for a lot of different companies and some of the magazines and stuff you see out there. So, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, Art, how do they do that? They can go to my website, uh, which is www dot art helen outdoors it's a-r-t-h-e-l-i-n outdoors.com and uh there's you can go through that and there's a contact uh spot on there where you can send me an email and contact me are you on social media at all yes you know so uh facebook um art helen outdoors uh if you like photographs instead you can go to wild reflections photo uh that's my photography page also, you know, there's Twitter, um, which I need to do a little more of, I'll be honest with you. And um, Instagram, have been trying to do a little more there, too. So, uh, But my main focus right now is, is a lot of stuff is on my Facebook page, on the Art Helen Outdoors page. Thanks, Art, for that background. Bob, I'm going to turn it over to you because I know you got a lot of questions from our listeners about um, deer vocalization. And we want to hear the story about why deer talk. 
You know, for you know, Art, I, I think this is um, going to be instructive and useful and, and educational for me as well. So I, I think why don't we just crank through um, uh, the, the presentation and slides that you have here um, to kind of keep us pointed. And then as we go, uh, if Bruce or I you know, run across a question or something, we'll, we'll interrupt just rudely. Sounds good to me. Perfect. Uh, we can, uh, well, if you want to get started, we can get started then. So, Let's do it. Uh, you know, why call deer is, is the biggest thing is that people have. And deer are very social animals. Uh, I used to guide elk hunters. I'd guide turkey hunters forever. And people do that because they like to hear that bugle. They like to hear that gobble from that turkey. They say, well, deer don't do that. They actually do. Deer are very vocal. Um, and they do it for reasons. They want to locate each other. They want to attract each other. They want to intimidate each other. So what our jobs are is we need to break down and figure out when do they want to locate each other, when do they want to attract each other, and when do they want to intimidate each other. And that's the biggest problem I think that we have is um, using things at the wrong times of the year in different types of calls and different vocalizations that we shouldn't be using, and so they're not working right. And uh, the other thing, you know, when we call these deer, we want to use their natural aggression, their curiosity. So these are things that we have to break down because we want to bring that animal to us. It gives us the opportunity to see deer that we may not otherwise see. These deer could be, you know, 200 yards away down in a thicket checking a bedding area at a certain time of year. And now all of a sudden you rattle or you grunt or you do something it might draw that deer out to you and you would have never seen that deer otherwise. So then you move into, well, if you're going to call these deer, what types of calls do you use? How do you call them? And so if you look at grunts, there's a couple different calls. There's grunts, rattles, snort, wheeze, bleats, and whines. And if you went and looked up deer vocalizations and deer grunts, you're going to get a list 10 miles long because they have so many vocalizations. However, there's truly three that I believe that will get you ahead of the game and get you started And as far as grunts. And those three grunts that you really need to learn are going to be a social grunt, a tending grunt, and a challenge grunt. And those three calls, um, if you want to hear those, the way that they work, so a social grunt is what most of us learn. So we pick up a grunt tube and you go out and you go. That's just a social grunt. That is what most people go out and use because they don't know any different. And so they'll use that at a time when they should be intimidating and it's not. And so they need to learn that there's also a challenge grunt, which a challenge grunt will start out and they go. They want to drag that out and sound like you're mad. Sound like you want to fight that other guy. Just like, just like when you're, you know, in high school and you kind of get mad at somebody, you're, you're going to show that and uh, you're going to get louder as you go along trying to intimidate that person. And that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to intimidate them. So that grunt again is just a <laughs> the long drawn out trying to sound mad. Then there's a tending grunt. A tending grunt is when a buck is following a doe that's in heat or thinks that she's in heat getting close. So a lot of people have heard this. They just don't know what it is. When a buck is chasing that doe, every time he puts his hoofs down, he's going. So he's ticking. It's like a tick, 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 tick. What he's doing is every time he's exhaling, pop, 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 pop. And he's trying to sound like he's chasing her. Then he'll try to get her to stop. So as he's doing that tending grunt, he'll. And keep trying to push her and try to get her to stop so he can get closer to check and see if she's actually ready to be bred or not. And that's your tending grunts. The other then is rattling. You know, when you get into rattling, people look at, you know, they think that they're going to just take and get all crazy with it and as loud as they can. And when they hit those, they're just going to get extremely loud and obnoxious. But there's different times of year to do different things. There's times when 
truthfully, you just need to take those and click your antlers together, just like your two small bucks coming together, and you're just kind of kicking those back and forth. Okay, so that's what you kind of, there, there's times when you want to do that and make those sounds a lot less and, and not be as intimidating, okay, because they're younger bucks doing that. Then you also, again, when you get into rattling later on, when you sit there, you want to, if you've ever heard bucks actually rattle, they don't come up and just start cracking. They'll actually come up, they kick those horns together, they separate, then they crack. But as they go through, they'll stop because they have to push each other. So when they push each other, those antlers come to a spot where they lock together, and then they're going to push each other, stop, and then they'll start rattling them again. Okay, so you need to learn the techniques and how to rattle properly. And if you want to be soft or if you want to get aggressive and when to do that. Um, the next one is the snort wheeze. So when you're snort wheezing, this call I don't like to use at all as a blind call. What I mean is I'll rattle, I'll grunt, I'll do those things when I can't see that deer to try to get its attention to bring it in. However, with a snort wheeze call, a snort wheeze is more for a mature deer. So if you have good age groups on your property, that snort wheeze works really well on those four, five, and six-year-old deer. The difference is, is those deer are a lot smarter than that one-year-old and that two-year-old. So they aren't going to come charge in. They try to get downwind of you. So what I like to do is if I see that deer actually moving and I know that the wind is coming in my face, I don't want to grunt or I don't excuse I don't want to snort wheeze at that deer until he's at a point past me that I can call him down in front of me. Because if I call too soon, he's going to try to get behind me downwind of me and bust me before I can get that shot. And a snort wheeze, you know, there's a lot of new calls out there that actually have them built right in. So it's just... Draw that out. It's too short... Is how you want to do that. A lot of times you can even do that with your hands if you have to, but cup your hands. It'll give that little extra boost to that sound, to that air. So, you know, that call, again, is used very well with older, more mature deer, but don't use that as a blind call. Um, why do they too do many that? Of those why deer do they sneak that? behind you. Was why, do they, why do they snort wheeze? They snort wheeze. It's an intimidation call. It's it's strictly about who is who on the schoolyard. It's it's I'm here to intimidate you. If you challenge grunt and they don't, a snort wheeze is strictly to intimidate the other deer. And so that's why it works on more of your older mature deer than your younger deer. I've seen it done where, you know, you've got good age groups and you snort wheeze at a two year old deer when you've got four year olds and five year olds on your property, it looks like you took that two year old and shot him out of a cannon. Because he's already intimidated. He's been there. I've seen him turn around and take off so fast, you know, that I've, I've watched him actually, and we filmed it, where you snort wheeze at a two-year-old, and they'll try to get out of there so fast. I've actually watched them spin so fast and bounce off of a tree, and down through the woods they go, and they're gone. Um, one and two-year-olds, that's a call that I just usually don't use on them, more of a grunt on those, because it's it's strictly intimidation. That's what it is. So well, I'm gonna try my, I, I want to try my snort wheeze, and then you can tell me if I get an A, B, C, or, or not so bad. Pretty good. Just try, try to draw that last one out as far as you can. So, yep. 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 There you go. There you go. The yep, funny thing, I, sure I did that. I did that to a two and a half year old, and he just went inside out. Uh huh. <laughs> Which is <laughs> now it's laughing. It's good and it's good and bad because <laughs> one, you know that that means you have good age class and you have more mature bucks on your property, but it also means that you're probably not getting an opportunity at that two year old if you want to shoot no. that deer. So <laughs> but why said, let's stop like there. Let's stop yep. there for a second because a lot of guys, they'll get excited and they'll see a buck, they'll see horns, it's got a great frame, but it's a young buck. And so they'll, they'll snort wheeze at him. And he takes off 
And if the timing of the season isn't right, then that mature buck's going to wonder what's going on. And he'll get curious. Right. Agreed or disagreed? Agreed. Um, you know, there, there's certain times that these calls should be uh, used and certain times when they shouldn't because, again, those those older deer that are using this call more than other deer, they've been down this road for years and they already have it figured out because the rut is all triggered off of daylight hours within a 24 hour period. So when it gets to that, they understand that and they know when these, this is going to happen. And this is when they start using this intimidation factor more is throughout that time frame. So, you know, I'm going to break down here in a little bit. I'll break down those actual dates for you. Um, you know, for the Midwest and dates fluctuate a little bit once you get out west uh, and down south from what they are here in the Midwest. But uh, as you said, yeah, if you use that at the wrong time, it's just like using social grunts at the wrong time. You use those and that buck just lifts his head, kind of looks at you and walks right on by and you get frustrated and want to take your grunt call and throw it out of the tree because it's a piece of junk and it doesn't work. A lot of times it's because we're doing things at the wrong time of the year. So, Bob, questions? You know, right now I'm soaking it up. I think one of the, the questions that we get on a regular basis is, you know, they'll, they'll catch a mature buck on a camera at night and it's nocturnal. And you go, how do you take and get that nocturnal buck in, into a position where you get an opportunity for a shot? And if, if you knew as you were checking game cameras, you got a mature buck and he's just not coming in your direction. What types of strategies would come to your mind with calls to try to get that opportunity? Well, again, it's all going to depend on the time of year. Mm -hmm. Um, because if it's early in the year, uh, we're going to break down some different strategies for you here in a little bit on how they're going to move through there. And and again, once you get into that pre-rut and that rut, now it breaks down even different uh, depending on the days because a lot of these deer, if you're using, you know, if you're rattling too late in the year, it's not going to do anything to get that buck out of his bed and come check because he's already, they've already been through that intimidation phase and, and doing what they're doing. So you have to really look at days and look at the moon phases when that moon phase is saying, hey, those deer should be on their feet now throughout, you know, daylight hours and then use these calls to your advantage. Okay, so, so you're going to cover that here in just a little bit. So I'm 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 getting ahead. That's all right. That's all right. So Super. um to kind of finish up the calls here, uh you know, bleats and whines. So there's different types of fawn bleats, different types of uh doe grunts and estrus whines. Why do you want fawn bleats? Well, you know, again, when we get into the next phase, we're going to kind of cover that, but you need to learn those. And some of these new grunt calls are great because you can actually go from buck grunt and just switch it over and go right straight into your doe. There's also push places on here that are push button for them. But you want to go. That's your fawn bleeds. Your doe grunts. You can tell the difference in that compared to a buck grunt. Buck grunts are short, they're quick, and they're deep. Fawn or a doe, they're going to be just a little bit more drawn out, a little bit higher. Okay, and then your fawns. So learn that fawn distress. That comes in really handy, you know, during that first phase, if you want to shoot a doe early season. Um, as far as estrus wines, well, they came out with this neat little toy years ago, you know. <coughs> Pretty hard to mimic that on anything else. They make different sizes uh, for how loud you want to get. If it's windy days, I like the bigger easy bleeds. <coughs> The real easy way to do your estrus wines, just, you know, go out and get an easy bleed and uh, you can get different sizes so you can sound smaller or you can sound, you know, like a older, more mature doe. Um, so now I guess that you know these different types of calls. It is, you know, when are you going to use them? 
is uh, and, and how are you going to use them? Well, you want to really use them um, throughout the changes of the breeding season is what you want. And uh, there's also seasons prior to that which would be the early seasons, which there is no pre-rut or rut. You are what I call phase one, which is a season opener. And it depends on where you're at. You can go to North Dakota. You can go to Kentucky. Some of these areas that open, you know, September 1st when they're still in velvet. And just coming out of velvet to other areas that, you know, are right around one week after they rub their velvet. Um up until some states don't open till October 1st. So you, you've got a whole month in there that's kind of phase one that things are different. And so depending on where you're at, if you're out in North Dakota, Kentucky, uh, even Wisconsin, some of these states that are mid-September, I like to get out there and do a lot of, you know, your fawn bleats at that time and wines, your social grunts. And why do you look at that? What happens at that time of year, if those fawns are still with their moms, what happens is that buck's mentality is telling him that if he hears fawns still with that doe, so if she's sitting there doing her fawn bleeds, she does some doe grunts, that buck hears that, and it's a mature buck, not necessarily your younger bucks, but your mature bucks, they're going to come in there and they want to run those fawns off. Because the sooner they get that fawn off of that doe, the sooner that she comes back into heat. It's not going to happen. Mother Nature won't make it happen. But that's his mentality. It's that way with all nature. You look at bears, bears are the same thing. The sooner they can get those you know, cubs away from mom, the sooner she'll come back into heat. It's the same thing with deer. The sooner those fawns are gone, the sooner that she's going to come back in. So it's, you got to play that card, the curiosity card do those fawn bleats and try to get that buck to come in with the curiosity and say, you know what? I've got to push these fawns away. I get these fawns away from mom. She's going to come back into heat. The other thing is if you like to shoot does in the early season, that's when you want to do the distress calls. <laughs> because if you do a fawn distress, it's, you know, mother's way of protecting the young. So she'll come in, you know, usually gangbusters coming in to try to protect those fawns. And then we're sitting there being all mean and everything, waiting for it to come in to fill the freezer. And, uh, you know, just working off of her instincts is what we're trying to do. Again, it's we're playing them. So the other thing is social buck grunts at this time of year. And why is because this is like they're just coming out of velvet. So this is like the first day of school, your first day of high school. You know, so now all these guys are coming in. You got your freshmen that are walking into high school, and they're like, you know what? Man, this is my first year with antlers. I'm pretty big stuff. So they come walking into school doing their thing, and all of a sudden that senior comes around the corner, which is your five- or six-year-old buck, and all of a sudden that one-year-old's like, whoa, wait a minute. I guess I'm not so – or that freshman's like, I guess I'm not so big anymore, am I? And so he backs off. That's what that social grunt is about. Those older mature bucks will come in to see which new bucks are in their territory because they're trying to figure out their home range. You know, because you can only have so many mature bucks in a certain home range. So those mature bucks are trying to figure out what is their home range. And so when they hear these other bucks, their curiosity, they're going to come in there, see who's there, do their posture thing, show them who they are, and move on. And so that's a good thing early like that. So and especially before that 15th of September, uh, 20th of September. So if you're out in a different area um, doing that, then, you know, you're going to move into what I call phase two. Well, phase two is that September 15th, 20th through that first week of October. So now you're picking up your other states. The other calls work well up until the 1st of October. But there's other things that you can actually add now um, that you can't really put ahead of time. And what I really like to do when I get into this part is not only social buck grunts, but I really start to um, bring in that light rattling. At this time of year, you know, all the seminars I do, I usually ask the question, how many of you guys are rattling, you know, by the first couple weeks of September, mid-September? And you might get one or two guys. 
And I say, all right, guys, how's it work for you? And they all go, works great. As long as you don't go gangbusters. Because you're not going gangbusters at this time of year. That's why I said you have to learn the different sounds and, and the different techniques of rattling. Because at this time, this is when you just want to do your... what we call tickling the antlers together so you just want to you want to tickle because at this time usually your big deer and as soon as i say it never happens <laughs> it's going to happen somewhere but usually those big deer they don't you know they're not out there really fighting and, and brawling because they already know it's that one and two year old they're sitting there and so they're tickling their antlers together trying to figure out who is who and pushing each other around where that big deer He's going to come in again, curiosity, again, just like that first day of school, and say, all right, who's making these sounds? Who's doing the grunting? He's going to come in and try to break them up, posture, show them who's boss. So these calls early in the season like this work really, really well, um, especially here in the Midwest. When you have your better concentrations of, you know, your one, two, three, and four-year-old deer plus, you know, your five, six-year-old, your good age class, this works really well early like this. I had a friend of mine years ago he called me up, and he says, hey, he says, I got this really big buck every night to come to this field. And uh, he just, he, he won't do anything. He sits there, and he, I grunt at him, and he goes up to the top of the hill, and there's these two little bucks that have fought over there a couple nights. He says, little couple one-year-olds. And he doesn't even pay attention to me. He goes over there and he breaks them up and then he follows them down in the woods. I'm like, well, get all your rattling antlers, buddy. Get, you know, do a little tickle and do some stuff when he's not, when those bucks aren't there. He's like, well, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> well, he's been watching it for how many nights now actually happening. So he did. And I knew this kid and he kept telling me, you know, that this was a giant buck. And so I'm assuming that, his giant buck was 140 inches, which is a good deer. Don't get me wrong. But when I hear people tell me giants, I'm thinking, you know, giants. So this kid, he, uh, he ends up shooting it, calls me up and, uh, he's telling me the whole story. How the deer came out. He grunted at it, did a little bit of tickling with the antlers and the deer turned and walked into him. He said, it didn't come running like it does in the rut. And I said, they're not going to because it's curiosity. They want to see who's there. They don't want to come and fight. They just want to see who's in their territory. Deer came in, he shot it. 187 and 5 eighths. Whoa. So it, yeah, it was a giant. So it, it works. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's, uh, that, that's a big deer. I don't, I don't care what state you're from or where you hunt. 187 yeah, yeah, inch yeah. deer. So. How'd the, um, kid, how'd the kid keep it together? You know, I don't really know, to be honest with you. Um, because, you know, a couple of years prior to that, he's like, man, I just shot an absolute giant. You see this thing, it's huge. We got out there, it's like 115-inch deer. He's like, it's the biggest deer I've ever seen, I've ever shot. And so that's why when he told me that this thing was a giant, I was like, okay. So I don't know if he just truly didn't know that it was that big. And uh, that's how he kept it together. But I know once we found it, he didn't keep it together very good after that. <laughs> It was it was pretty neat to watch him. So, but uh, oh. it was a neat deer, and, and he said it worked just great. He said, but again, at this time of year, they're not going to come running to you. They're just they take their time, um, and slowly come in because it's the curiosity factor at that time. What dates so, are those again? So the the just the light tickling, and I just that's what I call oh. them tickling the the yep. points. Actually, I I just tick the points. Yep, and usually you start. You know, here in Wisconsin, I'll say the opening weekend, so like around that 15th, and it goes all the way up until usually the end of the first week of October, second week of October, because then what happens is you fall into our October lull. <laughs> and uh, so anytime right up till then, it usually works because they're trying to figure that out. They want to know who's who and who's moving into areas because sometimes those deer die. You know, there's... We have CWD here, so sometimes they'll die from that, or they die from EHD. They get hit by a car, or they hit, you know, or they just get pressured and moved to a different area. So now there's a new buck in that area. 
So, you know, they're always trying to figure out who's moving into their home range, these mature deer are. And so they want to push them out or are going to get pushed out themselves into a different home range. So that's why it works so well. How big's my home range? I'm a mature buck. I'm four and a half, five and a half years old. How big's my home range? You're definitely a mature buck. I'll give you that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Art. <laughs> Come on, brother. But, uh, <laughs> hey, we're all there. We're all there. Hey, Bruce. That's all I can say. <laughs> that's all I can say. My home range but, is pretty darn good. It's about a thousand <laughs> miles come fall. <laughs> yeah, my home range goes a long ways, but actually, <laughs> that's the funny part is, as we get older, we travel a little bit farther, but as the deer gets older, his home range gets smaller and smaller. And uh, it's kind of neat because right now I'm doing some studies with the DNR, and we've been tagging deer and putting collars on them. So we get to watch where they actually move to and what they're doing. And they're finding out that these older, mature deer, you know, a, a one- and two-year-old, they don't travel too far yet. A three- and a four-year-old, those deer, we've uh, – I was talking to the – guys that were running the collars the other day and they've got a buck right now that is 12 and a half miles away from where they collared it whoa um so yeah he's he's moved a long long ways the majority of them don't most of these and then as they get to five six and seven years old they're finding out that some of these deer live in eight nine hundred acres or less they just they keep getting smaller and smaller depending on the topography of the land and different things. But so it's, it's kind of different watching that and how they are. But, yeah, as they get older, their home range shrinks. But that, you know, three- and four-year-old, those, those bucks will travel a long ways. It's just like us. You know, when we were 16, 17 years old, you know, we'd go so far. But once we got, you know, into our 20s, man, we'd take a car and <laughs> you'd drive, you know, 50, 60, 100 miles just to go see your girlfriend or farther. And uh, so at that time, it's it's no different than them. That's how I class that three- and four-year-old deer is that, you know, 20 to 25 or 28-year-old man that likes to fight and likes to travel, and, and he's the one that likes to do that. As they get older, I look at it like my dad, who's in his mid-70s, you know, he's got his own routine and just kind of keeps, you know, staying closer to home and staying closer to home as the years go on. And so that's what deer do, too. So thanks for that. And a, pe- a lot of people have different ideas about it, but pretty much, um, you know, listen to what Art says, because if you got the right size acreage and doing everything with your food plots, you're holding mature bucks, even if you haven't seen them, because he's there. Oh, yeah. They're there. They're pretty sneaky, though, so they got to figure it out. So, but um, so moving on with this, though, we get into, as I said, after we get done with that, now we get into the October lull. Everybody hates the October lull. The thing is, is with the October lull, calls don't work real well. Very few do. And the reason is because a lot of these older deer, the mature deer, they start locking down on your proteins. They want your acorn ridges. They want whatever you have planted in your fields that are the highest protein because they know that the daylight's getting a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter, so they know what's going to happen here shortly, and they're going to be burning all that protein and all that fat off. So they're trying to put on as much weight as they can. So you just have to hunt them smarter, get in their bedroom or get as close to their bedroom as you can. And at that time, you know, you might try to do a little bit of social grunts or some some challenge grunts uh, as you get closer to the end of that October lull. Um, then you could start maybe a few challenge. But honestly, at that time, it's pretty tough to call deer because they just don't want to move much, especially those mature deer. They don't want to go anywhere. So, yeah, it's food source. So, it's food source hunting. You know, during that those days. Yep. You just it is. That's what you got to do. When you're, it is. And the, the problem is when you're in there, though, on a food source is you have to hunt that food source smart because they don't want to travel far. So now they're bedding closer to those food sources. So you have to get your ingress and egress routes, you know, so that they're not winding you walking in. They're not seeing you They're You have to be screened. There's little things that you have to do different to get in there, um, because if you keep bumping him off of there, you're going to bump him and not even know you're bumping him. And then he's going to disappear. 
So you just have to be smarter in how you hunt those little areas. Um, but it can be done because they have to still eat. They have to, you know, they have to drink. They have to eat. They have to do their thing. They can't just disappear. I've always heard that people are like, all my bucks just disappeared. It's it's the October low. They did not get on a plane and go to Jamaica for vacation for two weeks. It just did not happen, you know, at least not that I've ever been aware of. They're there and they're there somewhere. It's just that they don't want to move as much. So you just have to adapt to it. Yeah, so. here's a whitetail rendezvous tip. Um, long distance scout. If you know the buck's there, you got to have him on your trail camera and he just where did he go? So get on a hillside a mile away, get good glass, and watch that food source. Early in the morning, late in the day, you know, low light conditions, but watch that, and you'd be surprised what you're going to see. Your thoughts? I 100% agree with you. And, uh, yeah, try not to put pressure on him because the more pressure you put, the more he's going to move. And uh, they don't like pressure, you know, especially those older deer. They just don't like it. So. Um, scout from a distance, great point, and then try to sneak into those areas uh, if you've got good ingress and egress routes and get in there and hunt them smart. So. Yeah, the final thing on that, you got one shot. I, I call it, it's a one shot deal on that food source because if right. you blow him out, he's gone. Yep, definitely. And, and here's a little tip for you that I like to do at night. If I'm hunting a food source early in the year and there's You've got a concentration of does and uh, fawns and stuff on that field, but you still got those big deer. What I like to do is I like to take a coyote howler with me, and then as it gets dark, wait until right after dark, and then, or just so you can't see, and I'll blow that coyote howler down in the woods like I'm in the woods and make it sound like I'm getting closer to that field. So then those deer, all of a sudden, they'll bust off that field and think it's a coyote. As soon as I see those deer get off that field, that's when we'll pack up, get out of that tree instead of having to walk through them and bust them out of there ourselves. Let them think that it's a coyote or something coming into that field to bust them out. Get them off that field and get out of there as fast as you can. Then you can come back and hunt that because if they get you as a person coming through and busting them out, you're going to get your one shot deal or two shot and they're going to be gone, especially as older deer. But you do that as a coyote some type of animal like that and get them busted off of there, you've got a better shot at it more often. So, Thanks for those little tips, Art. Let's get back. Bob, you got any questions? Nope, I'm soaking it up. All right. <laughs> we'll get back to Now we get into the fun phase. This is phase three. Um, this is the pre-rut phase. Here in the Midwest, I'm looking at October 25th through November 10th. Uh, this is when you can cut loose because a lot of your deer are still on a pattern. They're going to your food sources. They're going to different areas and they're really susceptible to being called in at this point in time. So now you can get into your long drawn out buck fights. Um, get your heavier antlers out. Uh, you can get um, bigger rat pack. Sound like more mature deer. because This is when your mature deer are fighting. This is when they're getting very territorial. They're fighting over does. Um, they're just doing their thing. And so you can do that long, drawn-out buck fight. And I always laugh when I've heard people say, well, or, or the question is, so how long should I rattle for? How long should I rattle? What should I do? How should I? And I've listened to people say, well, here's the deal. Rattle for 30 seconds, then blow two grunts, then rattle for a minute, blow a grunt, then do I've never heard a deer in my life do that. <laughs> you know, I've heard deer where they've come up and they'll walk by each other and all of a sudden they'll turn around and you'll see them and they just kind of stick a little bit, maybe crack their antlers once and that's it. They'll push once and they know who's who already and they're done. Then you get a couple mature deer, they'll come in there and all of a sudden they'll start, they'll crack. And they'll go at it for 45 minutes straight. I've heard them, you know, watch them break over little trees and saplings and, and just go at it. You know, at the same time, however, I'm sitting there and I usually, and uh, it'll look goofy on here. I'm going to tell you that ahead of time. So, but I will usually take that grunt call and I'll hold on to it with my mouth, with my mouth because when that deer, when they stop for a second, when they push off again, they usually exhale and grunt. So, so 
so make it sound realistic because they're going to grunt at the same time they're pushing with those antlers as they exhale. So if you're trying to rattle, then you put the antlers down, then you try to grunt, do those things, it doesn't sound realistic. Okay, so you want to sound as realistic as you can. But during this time, like I said, you can do these long, drawn out channeling grunts. Usually a grunting series at this time, I'll start out, I'll just and then I'll either snort wheeze if I see that deer and know where he's at, know what he's doing. If I don't see him, I'll do that challenge grunt, then I'll get into rattling. Because usually that's what they do. They don't just walk by each other and crack their antlers. They usually see each other and they'll grunt, they'll snort wheeze, do something to each other. So that time of year you can do that. Very aggressive tending grunts. This is when you want to take both these with you. And so you can start with your estrus bleat. And as you're doing that, you can turn and make that sound one way or another. That's what calls these turn for. That's why they're flexible. So you can Now you sound like you're actually physically chasing her instead of grunting. Don't ever grunt right straight at an animal. They'll pick you out like that. You always want to sound one way or another. Okay, so start one way and go the other and sound like you're actually following that doe back and forth. The nice thing with these is because they turn like that, you don't have to sit in a tree and have all this movement. All you have to do is move your hand, and that's it, back and forth. Let's so, give a plug for that. Um that uh, grunt tube who makes it night and hail night and hail makes this and uh they've also got uh there's a couple different ones out there um that they have uh this year they've got a new bone collector series out that is actually uh very similar to this but instead of changing here that one actually you press down on um and all of them it, it's each one is different, so one thing that you have to do is try them all out and get used to them, because if you look at, like, the bone, they call it, this one, okay, you hear the sound in that, on, <laughs> sound completely different. This one takes more to blow and break over than this one does. So, you know, you need to really work with these so that when you get excited, <laughs> you don't sound like a wounded duck and go, <laughs> so if all of a sudden that's, that's not a good deal. You know, that I've done that. I'm coming, guilty. I'm guilty. Sorry. And all of a sudden you <laughs> want to go and, and challenge on him and go, Instead, you go, and that's not going to work, guys. So it's a bad deal. So each one breaks over to different points. So and it's, that's why each manufacturer, too, has so many different ones. You know, Night and Hail has, I believe it's four or five different grunt tubes. Um, some are just straight grunt tubes. Some actually have, you know, death chamber, they call it. This is built right in for um, your snort wheezes. Um, you know, you've got. This one here is one of my favorites, is the natural. This thing sounds incredible, um, and it's got the tube on it, and the tube is adjustable. So this one, um, and it's made out of wood. So that one blows over a little different than these do. Every one, you know, changes a little bit. So get used to those. But, uh, again, use those aggressive tending grunts at this time. Get aggressive with those because this is when they're really, those does are starting to come in. And they're really starting to push them to see who's in heat and who isn't. The thing is, though, is if you don't have a lot of age structure and you just have a lot of one- and two-year-olds on your farms and you're not into, you know, or even on public land, don't do a lot of the tending grunt. Just use a lot of the easy bleats and do a lot of your estrus bleats at this time. And the reason is is because... A lot of 
three and four year olds are your breeder bucks. And so if they hear that tendon grunt a lot, those younger bucks will end up getting scared away. You know, and if there's a lot of guys that'll shoot that one and two year old, I don't pay for your tag. I'm not pay the taxes on your land. You can shoot whatever you want to shoot. You know, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you you can't. Um, my own personal, you know, we look at four, five, and six year olds on our place. You know, personally, I look at five and six year olds on my own farm. But again, you know, you look at it's not my land. They can do what they want. So you have to be able to play that though a little bit and say, Hey, if this is all I have is the younger group or the, the younger population, I'm going to scare more of them away by using that tending grunt. So just strictly during this time frame, you know, do your long drawn out buck fights. Cause your one and two year olds will still fight. You'll call in those one and two year olds, but the aggressive tending grunts and stuff don't quite get, you know, is carried away with those. But if you have a good age structure, have at it because you're going to call in a lot more of those mature bucks throughout that time frame. Um, and your snort wheeze, guys, this is that time frame right now that October 25th through that November 10th, that snort wheeze, man, that's money. You want to kill big deer and call in big deer. When you see that deer walk across the field, most guys I talk to, the problem is, is they'll say, well, yeah, I grunted at that deer in this time frame. And they'll go, I'm like, all right, that's a social grunt. They don't want to do that. You got to remember, guys, we're in an intimidation factor now, okay? It's all about intimidation during this time frame. That's not very intimidating, okay? So we have to figure out what is intimidating. Intimidating is a challenge grunt and a snort wheeze. So if you challenge grunt him, he's going to stop and get his attention. Now let him get to that point. Now you snort wheeze. <laughs> you do that, more than likely, that buck, if he's not on a hot dough, he's going to come inside out, and he's going to come like hot and heavy and fast because he doesn't want you in his territory. He wants to know who the intruder is. We've killed a lot of really good bucks. You know, some five and six year old deer. And when I mean five and six year old deer, we take our teeth here because I so into the age thing that we actually take our teeth out of those deer and I send them to a place in Montana to have those teeth aged so that we're not just looking at a jaw guessing. We actually get the actual age of these deer. We know how old it is. I did read today, however, that there is a new place in Michigan. Um, that's a lot closer to me, so I might be sending them to Michigan instead. But, uh, you know, so that's how we really tell how old these deer are and, and can break that down. So at that time frame, though, again, that snort wheeze is very, very effective. But make sure you see where he's at and have at it with him. So, um, you know, and then what we do is then what happens is after they get through that pre-rut, and that real intimidation stage, now they get into what the peak rut. This is the breeding season, lockdown, everything else. Guys, I don't like this time of year, I'll be honest with you, because what happens is that buck that I've been patterning all year and looking for, he could be three miles away. He could be five miles away on a hot dough somewhere. Granted, I could have somebody else's buck in there, but the one that I really wanted to go after, he may not be there anymore. Or he may be almost impossible to call in because he's locked down with a doe somewhere. And, uh, this is the time frame that 10th of November through the 20th, 25th, that a lot of guys are using those social grunts or they're rattling and it's not working for them. Why? Because they're using either a social grunt or an intimidation factor and they don't want to be intimidated. They've already been through that stage. Now it's all about jealousy. Now they're like, well, so who's in our territory chasing that doe? So what I really focus on now is now I really change things up and I really want to do the estrus wines, the fawn bleats, and the tending runs. Um, and look at that. Especially if I see that buck chasing a doe and she won't stop, that means she's not ready. So now I got to hit that jealousy factor because they know those daylight, the, the hours of daylight is getting as short as it's going to get and the days are numbered. Mother Nature says, hey, your days are numbered. You need to get this done. So why would I want to fight anymore? <laughs> you know, if all of a sudden Mother Nature says, hey, you got 
10 days left to make this happen. Would I rather go find a new hot doe or would I rather go over and fight somebody? I'm not going to fight somebody. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to go find that hot doe. That's just the way it's going to work. And that's what these bucks, these older deer are doing. So if they're chasing that doe and she's not ready, hit her, hit him hard with those estrus wines and a tendon grunt. All of a sudden, he's going to be like, whoa, wait a minute here. <laughs> now I'm jealous. Who is who's the hot doe and who is chasing her? Because we've already established dominance. I'm in this area. This is my home range. And who is that? So now he wants to go kick that buck out of there. So I really focus on that at this time and uh, try to get away from the dominance calls. Try to get away from the rattling. Rattling sometimes will work if you actually physically watch a buck breed a doe. When he dismounts her, sometimes the rattling will work. I don't know if it's, you know, and I've, I've asked a few biologists and I've never really got a straight answer, but. You know, I don't know if it's the shift in hormones after, you know, just breeding or what that puts him in that outrage again, but sometimes that will work and that rattling works then. But I've had a lot better luck and more success by just going to jealousy calls than working with dominancy calls throughout that whole time frame. So um, then, of course, we get into rifle season uh, in a lot of different states. It's still that most of those are through that jealousy factor. So they still work um, up until usually after the second or third day and they've been shot at enough, they kind of go underground and, and disappear for a little bit. Um, and then all of a sudden you get to the end of the year, you'll start getting in that last phase, I call it or the fifth phase. This phase from December 5th is what I usually say until the end of the season, uh, post rut, Concentrate heavily on your food sources, guys. Your food sources, if you have the best food, and as a land management guy that goes out and sets up property, this is one thing that I really like to concentrate on is having the best winter food sources available. You know, again, watching these studies with the DNR, watching a lot of these deer coming into these food sources, they're looking at this year some of the biggest um congregation of deer coming into some food sources that we had were between five and seven miles from deer coming from that far in plus keeping our own deer there this is a great time you can shoot your neighbor's buck and then let your <laughs> buck get to another year you know and uh, i got some great neighbors so um you know we always joke about that and i'm like don't worry about it i said in december i'll shoot your deer but we already know you know we all get together and know all the deer and stuff but it might be a deer that you've never seen that's an old mature deer from five miles away that you could then shoot and let your deer get another, you know, a year on it and get more mature. But what happens then is because they congregate on these food sources so much is you have to go back to the socialize, socialization factors that you did early in the season. Because now all of a sudden these mature bucks, they're going to start laying close. They want to get close to those food sources because they don't want to burn that energy. They need to put all that fat back on. So if you've got, you know, great brassicas and you've got beans or corn, different things in there for them to eat, what I like to do, this is the time of year that I like to use a decoy. And I'll take a decoy and put that out there. And then I'll start doing my social vocalizations, my doe bleats, um, my social buck grunts, and my light sparring again. If you ever go and you grab game cameras late in the season like this, all of a sudden you pick those up, and all of a sudden you're like, hey, why are these bucks fighting all the time? And you've got a lot of these little bucks that are fighting. And that's because a lot of deer got shot during deer season, during rifle season. They got pushed out of different territories, different areas. Now all of a sudden they're there and they go, well, you know, who are you and who are you? And so they're trying to figure out who's who again, and it's that game all over again because – You've got all these new deer on these food sources. So to get them out there early, I like to put that decoy out there and sound like either that doe or like that young buck that's out there and get that big deer on his feet earlier in the day and make him make him feel calm and curious. Say, hey, look, there's already deer out there. We're good. I can get out there. That deer's not spooked. You know, he's talking. I'm going to go hang out with him and, and do what I got to do. So um, that phase 
is a, is a really good phase to get back to the basics as you would early in the season. So Art, talk about the, know, secondary talk about the secondary rut. Well, <laughs> there's a secondary rut, and I don't have Pass that the in there. A, I said it wrong. It's uh, really you know, the young end of the year it, coming into Astros. Okay. And uh, usually because in the seminar I actually have another slide that's just a deer that was shot during that because it's such a short time frame. It's a very short period where you look at it anywhere from 28 to 35 days usually after that first doe is bred. So what you need to do is you need to, if you have a good relationship with your neighbors or if you're really paying attention out there, public land, whatever, when you see that first doe being bred or hear about that first doe being bred, mark your calendars. Because usually... If she's not bred or if, if the other does and the young fawns aren't bred, 28 to 35 days later, they'll come back into heat again. And it's a very short time frame, and so it's a very fast and furious rut because there's not nearly as many of them coming into estrus. And so when that happens, um, a lot of those bucks, uh, they'll all of a sudden show up out of the woodwork again and start pushing them. This happens usually during this time frame when you're in that phase five and when you're back out on those big food sources. So that also affects that. So usually when I get into that first part of phase five is I will actually carry all my estrus calls and with me too, because if I see a doe that's in heat um, or if I see a buck that comes out into that food source and starts checking does again, that to me is telling me that, there's probably a doe somewhere in the area that's hot. And so the second rut or the second estrus period has started. Then I'll go back to using those estrus calls with pending grunts and do that for a couple days. Um, but it's so short-lived that it's it's really hard to monitor and figure out. Um, but you're going to use a lot of that same pre-rut strategy during that. Um, but again, you have to be able to really pinpoint it to know when that's happening. Art, I hate to do this, but we're coming up on our hard stop. So why don't you take the final uh, five minutes and summarize, and then we got to call her good. Yeah, and I'm yep. going to take in. Uh, let me pop up a couple of photos here real quick. And because uh, uh, you were kind enough to share them. Have you got that one in front of you? Yep. So, so we got- and that actually, that actually is one of those. That's the uh, secondary rut. That deer came out and was actually. Um, checking a few does where it was at. And so I actually hit an estrus bleed with that and uh, did a tending grunt and that deer turned and walked right to me. And um, I was actually set up to hunt that in a, uh, just a strict phase, phase five. Um, so that was uh, knowing when those dates were, that's what helped me kill that deer. Then we got this boy. Yeah, that deer was, uh, that was a November uh, 12th, I think, deer, November 13th. And that deer um, was a Kansas deer. So in Kansas, they're about a week later than us. So that was that pre-rut uh, fun stage. Actually snort wheezed that deer into me, um, rattled and grunted him in first. Things didn't happen. He kind of got away from me, snort wheezed him back to me and uh, ended up, getting lucky and having success on him too. So, and, um, I love that deer, buck. I love that. That deer. deer. <laughs> that deer was different. That deer, I actually heard tending a doe. And so I went right into tending a doe too. The whole woods went completely quiet and he challenge grunted me. And so I challenged grunted him back. And then when I finally saw that deer and saw what he was, I snort wheezed that deer, and he actually came in um, and tried to cut so close to me. I was in a ground blind, tried to cut so close to me that I actually shot that deer at five yards off the ground. Was that a uh, Kansas buck? That was, yep. So, yeah, well, this, they got some good deer out there. And this so, is how people find you. Yep, and that's how they find me. So, and, um, you know, I guess the last thing here real quick, because I know we're at the hard cut, and I was actually done with the seminar. You know, your best places, find some deer vocalization uh, CDs or, you know, YouTube. Um, 
Google them again, basic grunts, bleats, and whines. Practice at home again so you don't sound like a wounded duck when that comes in, so you'll know how that reed breaks over and stuff. So uh, with that, guys, I really um, I don't have a lot more to add to it, but uh, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm going to give a little shout-out to Whitetail Rendezvous. Art's going to be one of our summer guest hosts, and so we're going to have a little Bruce and Art show uh, sometime June and July and somewhat in August, depending on our schedule, but he, he's going to be co-hosting Whitetail Rendezvous, and you can find us any place in the world, digital world, just just uh, type in Whitetail Rendezvous, and I'm out there. It's fun, you know, and, and I look, again, I appreciate it, and uh, it's, it's been a blast, guys. All right, thanks very much. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and... On the next episode, we're heading up to Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and we're going to meet up with a friend of mine, Franz Diepstraten. And Hans is originally from the Netherlands, and he, he came over to Canada simply because he wanted more opportunity for himself, and he loves to hunt, and he loves to chase uh, wild sheep and elk and moose and anything else uh, on four feet. So he headed this way with his wife, and he works there in, in the Calgary area. But more important than that, he's a full-time hunter. He's a hunter 365 days a year. And he's going to talk about that extensively. What does that mean? Well, that means he stays in shape. He, he stays, he keeps his gear in shape. He keeps his, um, shooting, um, practices. He does all those things just for that one five second opportunity that the critters give. So you, Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.